Hi, kindergarten friends. So we're back with Stuart Little by E.B. White. And last time we read chapter 10, which was called Springtime. And we remember Snowbell met a friend that was going to get Margolo at night, but then Margolo got a note from the pigeon and she flew away. She flew north. So now we're on chapter 11 and it's called The Automobile. For three days, everybody hunted all over the house for Margolo without finding so much as a feather. I guess she had spring fever, said George. A normal bird doesn't stay indoors this kind of, in this kind of weather. Perhaps she has a husband somewhere or has gone to meet him, suggested Mr. Little. She has not, sobbed Stuart bitterly. That's just a lot of nonsense. How do you know, asked George. Because I asked her one time, cried Stuart. She told me she was a single bird. Everybody questioned Snowbell closely, but the cat insisted he knew nothing about Margolo's disappearance. I don't see why you have to make a big pariah out of me just because that disagreeable little chippy flew the chop, said Snowbell irritably. Stuart was heartbroken. He had no appetite, refused food, and lost weight. Finally, he decided he would run away from home without telling anybody and go out into the world and look for Margolo. While I am about it, I might as well seek my future, my fortune too, he thought. Here's a picture of him. What do you think he's doing? Maybe he's packing up, thinking about his, what items he'll need. Before daybreak the next morning, he got out his biggest handkerchief and in it, he placed his toothbrush, his money, his soap, his comb, the brush, a clean suit of underwear, and his pocket compass. I had to take along something to remember my mother by, he thought. So he crept into his mother's bedroom where she was still asleep, climbed the lamp cord to her, um, to her dresser, and pulled a strand of Mr. Little's hair from her comb. He rolled the hair up neatly. Oh, there's a picture of the comb. He's pulling a piece of hair out that he wants to take so he can remember his mother. He rolled the hair up neatly and laid it in the handkerchief with the other things. Then he rolled everything up into a bundle and tied it onto one end of a wooden mat. With his gray felt hat cocked jauntily on one side of his head and his pack slung across his shoulder, Stuart stole softly out of the house. Goodbye, beautiful home, he whispered. I wonder if I will ever see you again. Stuart stood uncertainly for a moment in the street in front of the house. The world was a big place in which to go looking for a lost bird. North, south, east, west, which way should he go? Stuart decided that he needed advice on such an important matter. So he started uptown to find his friend, Dr. Carey, the surgeon dentist, owner of the Schooner Wasp. There's a picture of him walking along the road. Okay, let's see, where was I? Oh yeah, the doctor was glad to see Stuart. He took him right into his inner office where he was busy pulling a man's tooth. The man's name was Edward Clydesdale and he had several wads of gauze in his cheek to hold up his mouth open good and wide. The tooth was a hard one to get out and the doctor let Stuart sit on his instrument tray so he could talk to him during the operation. This is my friend Stuart Little, he said to the man with gauze in his cheek. Oh, how are Stuart? replied the man as best as he could. Remember, because he has gauze in his mouth, so he can't really talk. Very well, thank you, replied Stuart. Well, what's on your mind, Stuart? asked Dr. Carey, seizing hold of the man's tooth with a pair of pinchers and giving a strong pull. I ran away from home this morning, explained Stuart. I am going out into the world to seek my fortune and to look for a lost bird. Which direction do you think I should start out in? Dr. Carey twisted the tooth a bit and racked it back and forth. What color is the bird? He asked. Brown, said Stuart. Better go north, said Dr. Carey. Don't you think so, Mr. Clydesdale? Well, it's a little hard, said Mr. Clydesdale. What? cried Stuart. I have a little heart, said Mr. Clasdale. He says, look in the Central Park, explained Dr. Carey, tucking another big wad of gauze into Mr. Clasdale's cheek. And it's a good suggestion. Oftentimes, people with decayed teeth have sound ideas. Central Park is a favorite place for birds in the spring. 
Mr. Clydesdale was nodding his head vigorously and seemed to be able to speak again. If you don't locate a bird in some dog hike, hey, you will have a highway railway and look in Connecticut. What? cried Stuart, delighted at this new kind of talk. What say, Mr. Clydesdale? If you don't locate a bird in some dog hike, hey, you have a railway and Connecticut. Oh, it's so hard for him to talk because he has gauze in his mouth. He says, if you can't locate the bird in Central Park, take a New York, New Haven, and Hartford railway train and look in Connecticut, said Dr. Carey. Then he removed the rolls of gauze from Mr. Clydesdale's mouth. Rinse, please, he said. Mr. Clydesdale took a glass, a glass of mouthwash that was beside the chair and rinsed out his mouth. Tell me this, Stuart, doctor, said Dr. Carey. How are you traveling? On foot? Yes, sir, said Stuart. Well, I think you'd better have a car. As soon as I get this tooth out, we'll see what can be done about it. Open up, please, Mr. Clydesdale. Dr. Carey grabbed the tooth with the pinchers again, and this time he pulled so long and so hard and with such determination, the tooth popped out, which was a great relief to everybody, particularly to Mr. Clydesdale. The tooth then, no, the doctor then led Stuart into another room for a shelf, he took a tiny, from a shelf, he took a tiny automobile, about six inches long. So that's the little car he grabbed. The most perfect miniature automobile Stuart had ever seen. It was a bright yellow with black fenders, a streamlined car of grace design. I made it myself, said Dr. Carey. I enjoy building model cars and boats and other things when I'm not extracting teeth. This car has a real gas gasoline motor in it. It has a quite good deal of power. Do you think you can handle it, Stuart? Certainly, replied Stuart, looking into the driver's seat and blowing the horn. But isn't it going to attract too much attention? Won't everybody stop and stare at such a small automobile? They would if they could see you, replied Dr. Carey, but no one will be able to see you or the car. Why not? asked Stuart because this automobile is a thoroughly modern car. It's not only noiseless, it's invisible. Nobody can see it. I can see it, remarked Stuart. Push that little button, said Doctor, pointing to a button on the instrument panel. Stuart pushed the button. Instantly, the car vanished from sight. Now push it again, said the Doctor. How can I push it when I can't see it, asked Stuart. Feel around for it. So Stuart felt around until his hand came in contact with a button. It seemed like the same button, and Stuart pushed it. He heard a slight grinding noise and felt something slip out from under his hand. Hey, watch out, yelled Dr. Carey. You pushed the starter button. She's off. There she goes. She's away. She's loose in the room. Now we'll never catch her. He grabbed Stuart up and placed him on a table where he wouldn't be hit by the runaway car. Oh, mercy, oh, mercy, Stuart cried when he realized what he had done. It was a very awkward situation. Neither Dr. Carey nor Stuart could see the little automobile, yet it was rushing all over the room under its own power, bumping into things. Oh, so look, this trash can just went flying, probably because the invisible car hit it, but they can't see the car. First, there came a crashing noise over by the fireplace. The hearth broom fell down. Dr. Carey leaped for the spot and pounced on the place where the sound had come from, but though he was quick, he hardly got his hands all on the plate, on the place when there was another crash over by the waste basket. The doctor pounced again. Pounce! Crash! Pounce! Crash! The doctor was racing all over the room, pouncing and missing. It was almost impossible to catch the speedy, invisible automobile, even when one is a skillful dentist. So there's a picture of him running around and trying to chase the car and he's looking underneath things and he's trying to grab it. Oh, oh, yelled Stuart, jumping up and down. I'm sorry, Dr. Carey, I'm dreadfully sorry. Get a butterfly net, shouted the doctor. I can't, said Stuart, I'm not big enough to carry a butterfly net. That's true, said Dr. Carey, I forgot. My apologies, Stuart. The car is bound to stop sometime, said Stuart, because it will run out of gas. That's true too, said the doctor. And so he and Stuart sat down and waited patiently until they no longer had heard any crashing sounds in the room. Then the doctor got down on his hands and knees and crawled cautiously all over the floor, feeling here and there. 
until at last he found the car. It was in the fireplace, buried up to its hubs in wood ashes. The doctor pressed the propeller button, but there it stood in plain sight, its front fenders crumpled, its radiators leaking, its headlights broken, its windshield shattered, its right rear tire punctured, and quite a bit of yellow paint scratched off the hood. What a mess, groaned the doctor. Stuart, I hope this will be a lesson to you. Never push a button on an automobile unless you are sure what you're doing. Yes, sir, answered Stuart, and his eyes filled with tears, each tear being smaller than a drop of dew. It had been an unhappy morning, and Stuart was already homesick. He was sure he was never going to see Margalo again. There's a picture of him wiping tears out of his eyes, looking at the crashed car. So, let's do, I want you to do a review on your fingers and talk about everything that just happened in that story. It seems like a lot of important things happened. So do a finger review, and each, on each finger, say something important that happened in that chapter. And then I want to know, why do you think Stuart is so sad right now? How do you think he's feeling? Why is he crying like that? And we'll see you next time for the next chapter, which is called The Schoolroom. Bye!